Welcome to the Close Reading Cooperative. I'm Fern Corey. I'm a professor of English here at Eastern Illinois University. I'm Kayla Jane Blue. I'm a student here at Eastern. I'm a senior English education major. We're here to talk about paratexts. Paratexts are not to be confused with parataxis, which Susie Park talked about a few podcasts ago. That's a sentence level stylistic feature. This is something else. Um, and to give you a sense of what paratexts are, we're going to start with a little story. And because Kayla was there, she's going to tell the story. Right. Um, in my senior seminar class in English 4300, um, we were reading this book, The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. And one of the, my fellow students noticed that there's a devilish recreation of the classic penguin icon on the cover. And um, some of the students in class had noticed it and some of us hadn't. But what we realized was that's very much part of the text. Right. And... The nice thing that they noticed, and Dr. Hoberman told me about this when we met in the grocery store and talked about it, is it was students who'd been in my young adult literature class who did notice it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is close reading of a different kind. I mean, to notice that kind of feature. It's not the part that English majors are used to looking at, which is the text. Um, so this is actually something maybe just regular readers are more alert to than English majors. So it seems like it's worth talking about. Uh, we're going to start by looking, going to the OED, because that's what we do, the Oxford English Dictionary, to look at what paratexts are, how we want to define that. Um, paratexts have, has a Greek root, para, which we see in words like parallel or paraphrased. It has a cluster of meanings that mostly mean sort of alongside or beside, and you think about parallel lines that kind of go, they're not, these lines are not the same, but you know, they run along the same course, or something like a paraphrase, which is not the same as the original that sort of you know, goes along the same lines. Um, there's also the medical use of the word, which is actually closer, which means um, in the proximity of. And so paratexts are those things that are in the proximity of the text. And they're going to be things that surround the text in one way or another. Um, this concept was, has been written about most extensively by Gerard Jeanette in a book, which in its English translation is called Paratexts, The Thresholds of Interpretation. And it's defined in this book as, on the back of this book, which is one of its paratexts, as liminal devices and conventions, both within and outside the book, that form part of the complex mediation between book, author, publisher, and reader. Titles, forewords, epigraphs, and publisher's jacket copy are part of a book's private and public history. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about um, how these are useful to students of literature and to scholars of literature. Um, and to start partly by saying that it's not um, all that surprising in a way that it came up, that paratext came up in a class in young adult literature, if, even if they haven't come up in other literature classes that you take, because in a lot of literature classes, most of the texts you read are in anthologies. The anthology is, in fact, a place where texts go to die, but they're, they are, I mean, these are decontextualized texts that what you don't have in an anthology are the paratexts that you have, sometimes not even the whole text, but you certainly don't have front cover, back cover, jacket copy, that kind of thing. Um, in a young adult literature class, you're more likely to read what we call trade books, <laughs> you know, books that, that go directly to the reader, that they're being marketed to readers. And you know, think about this. I mean, you know, Kayla, when you, when you pick up a book, what do you do? Well, first thing I do is look at the front cover. Okay. Um, looking at this front cover, you see there's a book award on there, a That's sticker. That's got to be good. That means it's got to be important. Um, somebody else liked it, at least. Right. And oftentimes, I flip it over to the back cover. You'll have a summary, or as you do on here, reviews by different authors or publications. And that might give you some insight to the book and let you know what you're going to be reading. So we're going to just give a few examples of, to give you a sense of sort of what you can do with this. I mean, and in the case of the Bloody Chamber, I know that the class speculated on what it might mean. I mean, why it was important enough to actually do something to that icon, to actually indicate to readers, you know, what might be going on there. And we're going to start with an um, example of a, a classic, a classic, not canonical, but a classic work, Forever, by Judy Bloom. And this is an early paperback edition of this book, which is about, well, it says right here, it's a moving story of the end of innocence. Um, it's a 1975 book. And so, you know, Kayla, if you, if you looked at that cover, what, what is that cover trying to tell you about what's in that book? 
Interesting, interestingly enough, it tells me that it's about a young woman. Mm -hmm. um, the locket suggests enduring qualities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the cover nice. is forever, the title. Mm -hmm. And um, it's probably going to be about romance. Good. That is totally true. Um, there's also, as we both observed, a little dissonance between, <laughs> between the cover and um, what the book is about. I mean, the book is also a book about a first sexual experience. There's really not a lot except the word innocence on the cover. Not to suggest it. I don't think you would know that. Um, and there may be some interesting reasons why that's true, why this book wasn't marketed as a book about sex. Um, not during its original publication. Not in the 1970s, because I think, I mean, there are always at least two distinct markets for a work of young adult fiction. One is young adult readers, and the other is gatekeepers, parents, librarians, teachers, the people who are going, critics, reviewers, I mean, people yes. who are going to decide whether this is okay for kids. Um, there is, the, this book does in fact have enduring qualities. Um, the book is still in print and there's a, a recent hardback edition. And now this is an, this is an in-between paperback. In-between edition. There's also a recent hardback edition, um, which we will show you. But do you want to describe what you see on the cover and what you think that tells us about right. what's going on in this book? Well, it's certainly a lot different from the original cover. Um, you see no faces, but you do see two sets of feet dangling off the end of the bed. And one is male and one is female. And so right away, you know from the cover, this is going to be about a sexual experience, or at least, you know, learning about sexual experiences at a young age. And um, the fact that it's so marketed with that right out in front of you on the front cover, the first thing you see mm -hmm. is a big change from the original publication. Clearly, social changes have taken place. And they're, they're so extreme that even for marketing this book, that it's, it's apparently OK for a kid to be carrying this book around, to be seen by peers, to have it in their home. Um, either that or the gatekeepers are really losing ground, which is, <laughs> which is another possibility, I yes. think, in this case, and that the young adult readers have a lot more power than they used to. Um, there's also another feature of this early edition of the book that um, whenever I bring my students over here to the Ballinger Teacher Center at Booth Library, they always comment on these little guys. Um, you, you want to talk about that just a little bit? Our little teddy bear stickers. Um, now, you don't always think teddy bear, juvenile fiction, um, but here this has become associated with it here at the Ballinger Teacher Center. And it might not be appropriate for every book in the Ballinger Teacher Center, perhaps not even for forever. Um, but one upon a time along the lines they decided that that teddy bear was going to mean juvenile fiction and now we've had some changes between children's books middle level books and young adult literature and the teddy bear is stamped on all of them no matter what the level age right i mean like like looking at the different covers i mean this is an artifact of the history of the development of young adult literature um at early 20th century in the 20s that was the first time we even had children's divisions of publishers before that mark twain louise may alcott 19th century writers they just sent things off to their publisher, the same people who published their adult works. Um, this, is, this is a different kind of thing. And over the course of the 20th century, we have subdivided that audience into different markets. Um, so now if you go into a bookstore that you'll see young adult books have been pulled out from the children's books, but you'll also see leftover parts of that history. Um, the major journals in my field are called children's literature, even though you'd write about young adult literature and everything else sure. in there. Um, and you get these adorable little teddy bears on books like, we were talking about this before, um, The Book Thief by Marcus Zuzak, which is narrated by death, set during the Holocaust, um, books with a fair amount of sexual content. Um, so, I mean, you see these artifacts, they tell us something about literary history. And it, it's a little easier to see that the further back in history you go. Um, one of the books that I've been researching and writing about lately is Call Me Charlie. It's a 1945 book by an African-American writer. Not a whole lot of African-American writers for young people in 1945. What we're going to look at in this case is the back of the book. And what you notice here, what I will point out to you, is that there is a picture of the author, which is a relatively unusual thing to see on the back of a book. Um, think of that more as a sort of inside back cover, maybe. It, it's really certainly not obligatory. Um, and then a certain amount of text about him. We get Judy Bloom. she's big enough, she, get, she gets a picture. But you, what I will tell you is that if you've looked at enough books from the period, 
and throughout history is it is way more common to have a picture of an author if the author is an author of color. I mean, one of the things this is telling you is that this author knows what he is talking about. And the jacket copy, or the back cover copy, plays along with that, that tells us he was born in Columbus, Ohio, and as a youth lived much as Charles Moss lives in, call me Charlie, he attended Ohio State University where he learned to box. Um, he's worked in summer camps, um, youth agencies, has attended the Writers' Conference at Breadloaf. Um, everything on the back cover is intended to tell you that this book is going to work, and you're going to, or that this, that the author has the authority, cultural authority, to write this book. That he knows enough about boys. That he's himself a real boy. Um, and this is all part of a particular cultural moment when, right after World War II, it seemed like a good idea to have more um, authenticity and authority became more important. It was crystal clear at the end of World War II why, what, what the um, what sort of the results of discrimination might be. Um, so Ursula Nordstrom, the most famous editor of her time for juvenile fiction, was looking for, looking for specifically a black author to write a book about a black boy growing up. And she asked Richard Wright, who turned him down, he actually also published with Harper um, Black Boy that same year, for the adult division. And she met this guy at a party. She met Jesse Jackson. He's not the one you're thinking about. Um, she met him at a party and asked him to write it. So, I mean, this book contains within it a particular cultural history, and we look at, in terms of the way it's marketed, that tells us something about the market. It tells us something about the audience. Um, I just noticed this morning, actually, um, this is a book that I took home because I want to read it. It's called Mexican White Boy by Matt de la Pena. And when, as I do, we opened up to the inside flap, we see there is a picture of this nice young man who wrote this book. And we see that he is young, which like being good at sports or something is something young readers of young adult fiction might want. We know that his first book won some awards um, and will soon be a major motion picture. He attended the University of the Pacific on a basketball scholarship and went on to earn a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at San Diego State. Lives in Brooklyn, teaches creative writing. Um, the copy for this book of what we would now call multicultural literature, what would have been called intercultural um, back in the 40s, follows very much the same lines. I mean, there are ways in which things have changed a lot, as we see looking at the covers of Forever, there are ways in which things haven't changed all that much. So, I mean, these are just a few examples of the way attention to parts of the book you may not think of as part of the text, as something that you can read closely, might be useful to you as a student of literature as a scholar. Um, and because we've been talking about youth literature, we'll, I'll, I'll ask Kayla to end by giving us sort of the moral, the moral of the story. The moral of the story is <laughs> um, that we're bringing these things together in our classes. Um, mm -hmm. Something that I've learned from Dr. Corey comes into play in another class, especially a capstone class such as your senior seminar. And um, hopefully then students like myself will be taking it into their career fields. Our, our classes are not intended to be watertight compartments. You are allowed to take tools that you've, you have learned about in there that are useful there into other, into other places, and then you'll become you know, among our, favorite, our very favorite students. So that's all we've got. Thanks so much. <laughs>